We're going to get into God's Word right now. If you want to follow this in a Bible, then please turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. You'll find message notes online on our app, as well as the Bayside Church website. And on those notes as well, you'll find some really good discussion questions. And they'll help you either if you want to go a little deeper personally or with your connect group during the week. The Apostle Paul summarized the Christian faith with three words. He said, following Jesus is all about faith, hope and love. And of course, the greatest is love. And so I thought it'd be great over the next few weeks if we explore those three things under the heading of our current series of courageous love. And so we're going to look at courageous faith This week and in a couple of weeks' time. Next week, by the way, Shane Willard is going to be back with us teaching the Word of God. So we're in Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to pick it up from verse 21. And this is an amazing, uh, awful, shocking, challenging story. Let's read it together. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Just pause there for a moment. This woman was not a Jewish woman, but she was fully aware of Jesus and who Jesus was. She referred to him as Lord, son of David. Son of David was a term for the Messiah, that the Jewish Messiah would come from the lineage or the generations following King David, and so she's recognizing him for who he really is. And then she goes on and says, have mercy on me. And that was a cry, a traditional cry from people who were begging. We see that 11 times in the gospels, people that were were begging, uh, they would say, have mercy on me. So this woman could have been a beggar, but she was certainly begging Jesus for an answer to her prayer. So in verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Mark's gospel in chapter seven gives us a few extra details about the story. He tells us that Jesus was actually in a house at the time and did not want anyone to know it. He was looking for a bit of peace and quiet, yet he could not keep his presence secret says Mark. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And then the next few verses are the same discourse that we just read a moment ago. And then if you go down to verse 30, she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Now, at first glance, this story seems so out of character for Jesus. He ignores her, he insults her race, and then he insults her personally. So what's going on here? To find out, let's go behind the scenes. Jesus is first of all testing. He's testing this woman's faith. He he sees in her courageous faith. And so this story, this dialogue is all about drawing this courageous faith out of this woman. Secondly, he's educating his disciples. Jesus often tested people before he helped them. Consider the the man who was lame for 38 years. He's sitting there begging, lame, can't walk, 38 years of it. And Jesus goes up and looks at him and says, do you want to be healed? I mean, really? Silly question, right? No, not really. What Jesus was asking here was, are you ready for the massive change of life that will come if I heal you and the responsibility that goes with it? See, this man, all he ever had to do was sit on the side of the road and and ask people for money. And obviously they'd given him enough money at least to, to live and to survive for 38 years. Are you ready for a massive life change 
and the responsibility that will come with that. Uh, after every gathering, when we're allowed to gather together, uh, after every gathering, I've been chatting with people over many, many years. I remember talking to one guy on one particular occasion and during the conversation, he said to me uh, that he had a bad back. Now, when anyone tells me that they have some sort of challenge, I always offer prayer. And normally people say, yes, please, that'd be nice, either because it's the right thing to do or they really want to be healed. And so I said to this guy with a bad back, would you like me to pray for you? And he said, no, I wouldn't. And that took me by surprise. I said, why don't you want me to pray for you? And he said, because if you pray and God heals, I will lose my invalid pension. And that really took me back. I mean, oh my goodness. But, but at least he realized the responsibility that would come if God actually healed him. And so Jesus tests this woman and the disciples are looking on. There are two tests. The first of them is indifference. Jesus simply ignores her. Lord, son of David, she cries, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. And Jesus did not answer a word. I mean, think about that if that was you or that was me. If someone came up to me and they said, oh, Pastor Rob, my daughter is really, really sick and I think she's under the influence of, of demonic power. Um, I really need you to pray. I mean, I'd be there or some of my pastoral team would be there to pray, but, but not Jesus. He didn't answer at all. That was completely acceptable in a first century Middle Eastern culture. In fact, Jewish rabbis wouldn't even talk to their female family members in public, let alone a perfect stranger. And so what Jesus is doing here was culturally fine and, and acceptable. But Jesus is just feigning indifference and he does that for two reasons. First of all, as I said before, he wants to draw out the courageous faith in this woman. And secondly, he wants to draw out the prejudices that he knows exist in his disciples. You see, Jesus' disciples would see nothing wrong with his lack of response. In fact, it would endorse views of Gentiles and women with which they felt totally comfortable. His disciples came to him and they urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. Remember, Mark's gospel says that Jesus and his disciples are inside a house. We don't know whose house, but they're in a house. This woman has come into the house and she's following them around, crying out after them. My daughter is demon possessed. She's sick. She needs help. I need help. And, and she's running after the disciples. And they're basically saying, Jesus, this woman, she's a bother. She's a pest. She's a Gentile. I mean, she's a woman. Let's get rid of her. Not only a woman, but a Canaanite woman the most morally despised of all of Israel's enemies. The disciples are revealing the prejudice they have towards this woman. And so Jesus is playing along with it. Kenneth Bailey in his brilliant book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, puts it this way. The text can be understood as follows. Jesus is irritated by the disciples' attitudes regarding women and Gentiles. The woman's love for her daughter and her confidence in him impressed Jesus. He decides to use the occasion to help her and to challenge the deeply rooted prejudices in the hearts of his disciples. In the process, he gives the woman a chance to expose the depth of her courage and faith. And then test two, which can be summarized in the statement, you're not a Jew, so it's not for you. I was only sent, says Jesus, to the lost sheep of Israel. Notice how Jesus doesn't give his disciples a lecture on prejudice. He's actually appearing to agree with their bigotry. I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's saying here. And, and I can just imagine the disciples are standing there nodding. That's right, Jesus. What you're doing is spot on. What you're saying is spot on. Preach it. All the blessings of God are for us. All of the kingdom of God is just for us, not for the Gentiles and certainly not for women. Preach it, Jesus. I wonder if we as Christians ever communicate something like that to the world around us. All the blessings of God, the love of God are really for us, not for you, 
dirty, rotten heathens. What follows is a stunning exchange of banter between this woman and Jesus. The woman comes now and kneels before him. Lord, help me, she said. I want you to notice there, he, she drops the messianic title and reduces her long statement to just three words, Lord, help me. What a great prayer that is. I call that an ambulance prayer. You know, when you're in the midst of some sort of dilemma, some sort of challenge, what you don't need at that point is a long, flowery King James prayer. You know, it's not, oh God, creator of heaven and earth, we beseech thee in the matchless name of Jesus Christ and on and on and on. No, 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 three words, Lord, help me. What a great prayer. Maybe you need to pray that prayer at the moment. It's a good one. And Jesus replies, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Really, Jesus? Was that necessary? To Jews, dogs were unclean animals, only slightly better than pigs. They were either savage guard dogs or scavengers feeding on garbage, but they were the, never the pets of Jews. Gentiles had pet dogs, but Jews never would. And even though Jesus uses the Greek word meaning little dogs or puppies, it still comes across as an insult. Jesus is verbalizing what the disciples were thinking. The promises and the blessings of God are for us, not Gentile dogs. How would this woman respond to Jesus? Well, she completely disagrees with Jesus. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the little dogs eat the little crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, just a little bit of power is what this little woman needs. Boom, mic drop right there. She's nailed it. And then Jesus says to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. You know, I love the Bible. I love reading and studying the Bible. But we've got to remember that, that the Bible is, is words on paper. And, and it misses some of the things that you would get if you were actually present. What we need to see in this story is this little bit of argy-bargy going on between this woman and Jesus. Uh, you don't get it translated, but probably a twinkle in Jesus' eye at different parts, or maybe even a nudge. And this little woman, she, she is a match for him. She, and he sees that in her, and he wants to draw that out of her. Jesus sees what is in you, not what other people might see, to put you down or to, or to have some sort of prejudice against you. He sees what's inside you, and he will do things that will draw that out just as he did with this woman. Her courageous faith was drawn out by Jesus. So before I wrap this up, some practical application. Three things very, very quickly. Number one, this story demonstrates God's love for all people. The prejudices in the disciples took years to overcome. Much of the New Testament scriptures address deeply rooted bigotry, intolerance, small-mindedness and racism as God constantly encouraged his people that his blessings were not just for their benefit but that as they had freely received they were also to freely give to others. That the gospel is for all people. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them and has committed to us the message of reconciliation, that God loves people and desires to have a relationship with them. I'm so glad in this day and age, the church has finally overcome all of its biases and prejudices. We are no longer intolerant of other people. Christians are not known anymore for their bigotry and bias. On social media, blogs and sermons, you never hear a negative or judgmental comment from a Christian about a woman or a refugee or a Muslim or people of colour or indigenous people or anyone. Oh, if only that was true. If only what I said was true, but it's not. As I heard someone say recently, racism is a 
pigment of the imagination. And many people's imaginations are coloured against the coloured. At the moment, we're seeing the fallout, not just around America, but around the world of the horrendous murder and death of George Floyd in the United States of America. Now, I'm not standing here trying to pick the splinter out of my brother's eye while we have a plank in our own. Right here in Australia, we have some major challenges. When you think about the Royal Commission that was held quite a number of years ago um, about uh, Indigenous young people in custody, and you consider that only a third of the recommendations from that commission have been implemented to this point in time. We still have a long way to go. And I know that, you know, we're divided probably as a nation and even in church divided about whether or not the recent protests are a wise thing. I understand people saying that they're not wise because we're right in the middle of a pandemic, but I also understand those who have just had enough. They're so full of anger and, and, and they're kind of just bubbling over with the frustration that here we are in 2020 and we're still seeing a horrendous amount of discrimination against people of colour. If only racism and the like no longer existed. I think we can unite on that as followers of Jesus Christ, seeing Jesus in action here in this story, uh, ministering to a woman who to uh, so many Jews would have been hated and scorned. And so the first practical application of this story is this. Are there any people that you think Jesus is not interested in? Can you relate to the disciples' prejudices towards this Gentile woman? If so, why don't you pray about that this week? Secondly, this story demonstrates courageous faith. Everything was stacked against her. She was a Canaanite woman, the lowest of the low, the most undeserving, and yet she had courageous faith. She was like, literally like a dog with a bone. She had bulldog tenacity. She grasped a hold of Jesus and wouldn't let go until he answered her prayer. I wonder, is there a situation that you're facing at the moment in which you need to display courageous faith? And thirdly and finally, this woman was desperate for help for herself. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, help me. Yes, she wanted healing for her daughter, but she also was a person in pain. She needed help too. She was a caregiver. And some of you are caregivers. And sometimes it can be harder to be the caregiver than the one receiving the care. You know, because everyone asks the person who needs care, they, they say, how is that person? What can we do for them? But quite often the person who needs the care standing there and saying, what about me? So this woman needed help for herself as well. And so we can apply that to all of our caregivers here at Bayside Church. If you're a caregiver, I'm gonna pray for you in just a moment. And, uh, and believe that God will bless and encourage and strengthen you at this time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just wanna thank you for your goodness and for your love and your grace. Lord, I thank you for all of the caregivers at Bayside, those who are caring for a loved one, a friend who is sick, unwell, going through a challenging time, Lord God, as well as those who are professionals in the medical field or some sort of uh, area of giving care. I know we've got people in our church community working in uh, homes for the aged and uh, in uh, mental health and in so many other areas. And I pray for those precious people, Lord God, the givers of care, that you would give care to them, that you will strengthen them, encourage them and bless them at this time. May we as your people Lord God, exercise courageous faith in the times that we need to do that. And I pray, Lord God, as we look around us every day that we'll realise that we never lock eyes with someone that you love less than you love us. May we demonstrate courageous faith. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.
Every week at Bayside, we're seeing people give their lives to Jesus and become followers of Jesus Christ. If you would like to do that, why don't you send us an email, connect at baysidechurch.com.au. Tell us that you'd like to become a follower of Jesus and uh, we'll send you some information and a Bible and get you happening on this journey.